up until now, we've covered uh, symmetric key cryptography. That's all we've looked at. The classical ciphers in the encryptor and decryptor, they both need to have a shared secret key. With DES, AES, triple DES, those block ciphers, they all require both sides to have the same secret key. And then last lecture we looked at random numbers and one role of random numbers is in stream ciphers. A stream cipher really is take a random number, XOR it with our plain text. And the decryptor takes, uses the same pseudo-random sequence and XORs with the ciphertext. But again, stream ciphers still are symmetric key systems in that both the source and destination must have the same shared secret key. This is called symmetric key cryptography and it's still widely used and it's uh, uh, especially for data encryption. But there's another form of cryptography called public key cryptography where the source and destination or the encryptor and decryptor use different keys. One key is used to encrypt, a different key is used to decrypt. But there's some relationship between those keys. So that's the next topic that we need to look at is public key cryptography and it will take some time to go through it. Uh, but to understand some aspects of public key cryptography we need to review some, some number theory, some very basic mathematics. So, so what we'll start today, you probably know half of it, maybe you forgot it but you, you've learnt it at some stage, so very simple, but we'll see it will lead to some, some uh, some concepts that we will use when we look at public key cryptography. So we need to know them now. So we'll go through, I'll introduce some concepts or refresh on some concepts, give a few very simple examples uh, today and maybe even a little bit next week. Some different aspects of, we'll just mention how to, about divisibility and some aspects of prime numbers and then modular arithmetic. Divisibility. We often uh, we want to care about uh, finding the divisors of a number. What, uh, given a number, what can we divide it by and to get uh, integer results? So we may say that B divides A if there's some, some number which we multiply by B that gives A where all those values are integers. So B divides A if, uh, if M is an integer where we can multiply M by B to get A. So we talk about a divisor. B, we can say B is a divisor of A. So this is nothing new. The other word we will use is a factor. We say B is a factor of A. And we sometimes care about the greatest common divisor. So given two numbers A and B, the greatest common, what is the greatest common divi divisor of those two numbers? Okay, so find the divisors of A and B and then of that set, or the two sets, find the one which is the greatest and it's in both of those sets. So GCD is just the abbreviation of greatest common divisor. There are actually some algorithms to, to find that for us. We'll do it for a few simple examples, small numbers, but when you have large numbers, and later when we look at public key cryptography we're dealing with some large numbers in terms of hundreds of digits then you need some algorithm to to go through and find greatest common divisors and there are some algorithms that would do it quite efficiently we can say and maybe this is new we can say that two integers a and b are relatively prime if their greatest common divisor is one okay. this is not prime this is a different thing, relatively prime. So any two integers, if their greatest common divisor is one, then we can say those two integers are relatively prime with each other. We'll see that in use shortly. Okay, just to be start simple, you can help me out. What are the divisors of 15? 
1, 3, and 5. Okay. And 15. 1, 3, and 5, and 15 are, can all divide. Uh, 15 we can divide by those four numbers, so we can say they are the divisors. I will not write them down, that's easy. Uh, usually we, all right, actually we can write them down just to be complete. We can say the divisors are 1, 3, 5, and 15. We can also write that number 15 as a multiple of some of its divisors and a multiple of its prime divisors. Okay, so we can say 15 is equal to 3 times 5. And in fact, any number we can do that. We'll see some examples. Uh, maybe it goes straight to it. What's the greatest common divisor of 15 and 16, for example? The greatest common divisor of those two numbers. Write it down, you, you find the answer. And someone in the looking at the TVs in the back rows, tell me the answer. <laughs> Greatest common divisor of 15 and 16. You can use your phone if you want to uh, calculate. Someone can help him. One. Okay, in this case it's one. So the divisors of 15 are 1, 3, 5 and 15. The divisors of 16 1, 2, 3, we cannot, uh, 4, 8, 16. Okay, they're the divisors. So the greatest common divisor amongst those two sets is 1. So, we, another thing we can say is 15 and 16 are relatively prime. Any two numbers which have the greatest common divisor of 1, we say they are relatively prime. Any more examples needed for that? No, I think you can find divisors, easy. Of course, if the greatest common divisor is not 1, it's greater than 1, then they're not relatively prime. They either are relatively prime or not. Uh, what's next? All right, let's look at prime numbers then. What's a prime number? Divide by 1 in itself. So any integer p is a prime number if and only if its only divisors are 1 and itself. Okay, so we know about prime numbers. And another thing we know already is that any integer, prime or not, can be factored or written as, its, uh, as the multiplication of a set of prime numbers. And the formal way, some integer a can be written as, there's a mistake here, this should be p1, this subscript of the first one should be p1 to the power of a1, p2 to the power of a2, p3 to the power of a3, up to pt to the power of at. In general, we can write any integer as multiplying a set of primes together. And that's probably best illustrated by an example. And we've done it already for 15. 15 can be written as 3 to the power of 1 times 5 to the power of 1. 
In fact, we can do it for all primes. 15 is actually 2 to the power of 0 times 3 to the power of 1 times 5 to the power of 1 times 7 to the power of 0. So in general, we can say that consider all primes and any number is made up of multiplying all those primes together raised to some power. But of course, when it's raised to the power of 0, it's just 1. So we write 15 is the prime 3 to the power of 1 times 5 to the power of 1. 16 How would we write it as multiplying primes together? Two times, no. Two to the power of four, quite simply here. So two is the prime. Raised to the power of four gives us 16. So two times two times two times two. Okay. Any integer can be written like that. Multiplying primes together. And in the reverse, then we can say that any integer can be factored into its primes. That is, given 15, we can find that 15 is made up of multiplying prime 3 times prime 5. So the prime factors of 15 are 3 and 5. The prime factors of 16 is 2. So we can find the prime factors of some integer. Let's try it for a few others, just to be clear. Prime factors of 22, find that. Don't all yell out at the same time. It can be divided by prime 2. And the other prime is 11. Hundred and forty five. Five. Five to the power of anyone? Someone's told me three. I don't think it's three. What do you get? 29? 5 times 29. 29 is a prime, correct? Okay, so it's 5 times 29. So all we're saying is that any integer, we can, uh, in theory, break it into prime factors. That is, the divisors of that integer, where those divisors are all prime. In practice, it's very hard to do with large numbers. And that will come up later as a security mechanism. Given a very large number, not 145, but maybe a number which is 145 digits long, given that, find the prime factors is a problem that's considered uh, too hard to solve with computers, uh, assuming that the, the number is large enough. And that will be a, a principle that's used in securing some systems in public key cryptography. Finding the prime factors is hard when we have large numbers. By hard, means it would take your computer forever to do it, given the current known approaches. So we know about prime numbers. This just lists the first prime numbers under 2,000. Okay. Uh, you'll start to remember some of the, early, the, the first ones up to 
um, the first 10 or 15 if you don't already. Finding the value of pi is hard. Pi is uh, the, the exact value, is it? Yeah. There are infinite number of uh, digits, isn't there? Uh, maybe that's a different definition of hard. Um, right, F finding, finding the value of a number which has an infinite number of digits in it is, is hard in that we cannot compute it in any time. Um, but it's of a no benefit for us really from a security point of view. Okay? Um, because no one can find it. But what we'll see uh, with primes and prime factors, a security mechanism will be that if you know 5 and 29, it's easy to find 145. Just multiply them together. So if you know the two primes, it's easy to find some large number. But if you just know that large number, it's hard to find the two primes. That's a principle or, a, or an idea that we'll take advantage of. Going in one direction is easy, going in the other direction is hard. But we'll see that later on public key cryptography. What else? Well, that's it about the first thing. Dividing numbers, prime numbers, just remember some of them. Uh, now we'll look at modular arithmetic. What is modular arithmetic? Finding the remainder. Mod we know is finding the remainder when we divide by something. Okay, so you know about mod. Uh, modular arithmetic is doing arithmetic. Addition, subtraction, division, multiplication, exponentiation, logarithm. they are our main six operations. Doing arithmetic, applying those operations where everything is mod by some number n. That's all. That's what we mean by modular arithmetic. Adding up numbers where we always mod by some number. And a lot of the, the concepts uh, follow from our normal arithmetic. So when I say normal arithmetic, the way that you add numbers and subtract numbers. So it's, it's quite simple in most cases. But there are a few things that will be introduced which are, are useful later. So just to find, uh, if we have some integer a and some positive integer n, we define a mod n to be the remainder when a is divided by n. So mod we know is the remainder. a divided by n, then a mod n equals the remainder when we uh, divide a by n. A is, oh, sorry, n is called the modulus. So we talk about the modulus. We can say two integers, a and b, are really equivalent or more precise, congruent modulo n if a mod n equals b mod n. And sometimes we'll write it like this. Uh, a and this equivalent sign or the three equal sign b in brackets mod n, meaning a and b are the same when we mod them both by the same number n. We define, so what mod n does, mod n is an operator that takes uh, the maps all integers into the set of integers defined as zn. That is, mod n as an operator as the input, we can have any integer. And the result will always be an integer from 0 up until n minus 1. If n is 10, for example, mod 10 means that any number, mod 10, the result will be always between 0 and 9. Okay? And that's defined as the set Zn. So the result of mod n is always a positive number between 0 and n minus 1. We don't have negatives. In some uh, interpretations of mod, you can have a negative value. So some programming languages may deal with a, a variation where you can have a negative value. In here, it's all positive results. 
So modular arithmetic performs arithmetic operations, so addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, exponentiation, raise something to the power, and logarithm, those six operations, uh, all performed within the confines of that set Zn, which means that the answer is in that set Zn. So we'll go through those operations. Some are very easy, they're the same as normal arithmetic, just mod by n. Uh, Alright, let's go through examples to illustrate the arithmetic. Let's say, start simple. Answer. Let's get there through this quick. Okay. So one thing we can write is we can say thirteen is congruent modulo three or equivalent to three when we mod them both by ten. So it's just the nota notation that we'll sometimes see. When we mod bu numbers by 10, then the answers are in the set Z10. The answers are between 0 and 9. That's all what we mean by Z10. So let's stay with Z10, that is in everything mod 10, and I will not write it mod 10, let's just keep the examples, we're using Z10 in this set. Answer. Not hard, don't worry. Answer? One. Okay. In this case, we're using modulo, modulo 10. Z10 means that everything is mod 10. So in addition, it's easy. We just do normal addition and then mod by n. All right. So in normal arithmetic, we have addition. In modular arithmetic, addition is just the same, but we just take the answer and mod by our modulus n. So addition is easy. What about subtraction, another operation? In and we'll do it a different view. Over here, the normal arithmetic. The normal approach, what's 7 minus 3? Not in Z10, but in our normal arithmetic. Is it 7 minus 3? Alright, easy. How do we calculate subtraction with normal arithmetic? Can we convert it to addition? Well, subtraction is just addition of a negative number. Okay. So, in just in, in normal arithmetic, seven minus three is really the same as seven plus minus three. Okay. So, subtraction is just addition where the number that we add is the negative of the number we're subtracting. And that, more precisely, is called the additive inverse. Negative 3 is the additive inverse of plus 3, positive 3. The additive inverse is what, when we add two numbers together, 
and we get zero, then those numbers are called the additive inverse of each other. So sticking so far with normal arithmetic, we can say, all right, plus three, additive inverse of minus three, and vice versa. Minus three is the additive inverse of plus three. Why? Because plus three, when we add them together, we get zero. When you add two numbers together and you get zero, then we say those two numbers are the inverse or the additive inverse. And subtraction, the operation of subtraction is really the operation of addition, but we add the additive inverse of the number that we're subtracting. So 7 minus 3 is the same as 7 plus the additive inverse of 3, which is minus 3. That's in our normal arithmetic, not modular arithmetic. But in fact, the same applies in modular arithmetic. Subtraction is just the addition of the additive inverse. And then we mod by n. What's the additive inverse of 5? Minus 5 in normal arithmetic. Okay, it's the negative. That's easy. Now let's convert back to modular arithmetic. And in Z10 in our example, And I'll write it as additive inverse AI. No, I don't have to write it all. That, what's the additive inverse of uh, 3 in modular arithmetic, in mod 10? Using the same definition of the additive inverse in our normal arithmetic, Additive inverse is the, when we add the two numbers together, we get zero. Three plus minus three is zero. Now, apply that definition for modular arithmetic. The additive inverse of a number is the number that, when we add to three, gives us zero. But in mod 10 in this case. Seven. Remember, we're doing it in mod 10 in this set of examples, Z10. So if everything's mod 10, 3 plus 7 is 0. So we say the additive inverse of 3 is 7 in mod 10. Any questions so far? So this is maybe new or a new way to think about some things. You know additive inverse already. You just don't think of it as being called that. Any questions? Okay. No answer means okay. All right. So slightly different now, we uh, treat subtraction as addition of the additive inverse. In the same way as our normal arithmetic, arithmetic subtraction is the addition of the additive, in additive inverse. So, let's try some. What is 4 minus 7? in Z10, in mod 10. Calculate 4 minus 7. Your calculator won't help much. 4 minus 7.
Well, we find the additive inverse. Instead of treating it as subtraction, treat it as 4 plus that, sorry, the additive inverse of 7. 4 minus 7 is the same as 4 plus the inverse of 7. What is the additive inverse of 7? Well, in fact, we found it here. The additive inverse of 3 in mod 10 is 7 because 3 plus 7 is 0. So similar, the additive inverse of 7 in mod 10 is 3. So it becomes 4 plus 3 equals 7. And I will not write it, but this is all in mod 10. 4 minus 7 equals 7. Sounds strange, but remember, all in mod 10. Of course, the other way to think of it is wrapping around. Remember the Caesar cipher? The, we implemented the wraparound feature as a mod, and it's the same. 4 minus 7, go back 7 spots. Where do you get to? You come back around to 7. If we have a sequence from 0 to 9... Z10 is a sequence from 0 to 9. If we start at 4 and we go to the back by 7 positions, where do you end up? At 7. Find the answer of these two. Two minus six is two plus the additive inverse of six. What's the number that we add to six and we get zero in mod ten? Four. So additive inverse of six is four. So two plus four is six. And now, I, for, just for brevity, I omit writing the mod 10 in all this. So it's all mod 10. 5 plus the additive inverse of 3. And we've found that before at 7. Two. 5 plus 7 is 12, and again, I... I'm lazy, I don't write the mod 10. Does every integer have an additive inverse? Let's try. Remember, we're still in Z10, that is the values from 0 to 9. Find the additive inverses. The number we add to A such that when we mod by 10, we get 0. Inverse? 0. 0 plus 0, mod 10 is 0. The inverse of 1? 
nine. That's an easy one. Four. And it turns out for any modul modulus n, every number has an additive inverse. We can always add two numbers together and get zero in mod n. Every number has an additive inverse, which means we can subtract any number from any other number in modular arithmetic. So they're easy. Addition, subtraction. Let's move on to multiplication and division, the next operations. Remembering that multiplication is just addition multiple times. Multiplication, we just add numbers together multiple times. Actually, let's, let's change our modu uh, modulus to be more fun. Ten's too easy. everything in maybe something a different modulus let's do Z8 that is everything's mod 8 from now on just for something different let's do multiplication multiplication in modular arithmetic is the same as in normal arithmetic 3 times 2 really in detail we say 3 times 2 uh, mod 8 okay so multiplication is easy same as normal multiplication just multiply and then mod by uh, our modulus n 8 in this case What's three times four? Find three times four. Three times four is four. Three times four is twelve. Twelve mod eight, we get four. Okay, so you can do mo multiplication in modular arithmetic. Division is more fun. Division. Division is just multiplication, but we multiply by the inverse. In normal arithmetic, that's how we do it. Again, we'll just switch back. In normal arithmetic, we can say... Eight divided by three is the same as eight times one over three. Where one divided by or the fraction one over three is the inverse of three. But this is called the multiplicative inverse. See if I can write it. Multiplicative. Inverse. Ran out of space. The multiplicative inverse in normal arithmetic is that when we multiply two numbers together and we get one, then we say they are the multiplicative inverse of each other. 3 times 1 over 3 equals 1. 5 times 1 over 5 equals 1. Okay, so it's easy in our normal arithmetic. And division is simply multiplication by the multiplicative inverse. 8 divided by 3 is the same as 8 times the multiplicative inverse of 3. The multiplicative inverse of 3 is 1 over 3. So... 8 divided by 3 is the same as 8 times 1 over 3. 
Let's apply that same concept for modular arithmetic to do division. divided by 3. What's 5 divided by 3 in mod 8? Division is the same as multiplying by the multiplicative inverse. Dividing by 3 is the same as multiplying by the inverse of 3. What is the inverse of 3 in mod 8? Well, the multiplicative inverse is defined as the number that we multiply by is such that the answer is 1. And that's the same in modular arithmetic. Multiply two numbers together, you get 1. They are the inverse, the multiplicative inverse of each other. So, 5 divided by 3 is 5 times the multiplicative inverse of 3. Am I all right? What is the multiplicative inverse of 3? times something mod 8 equals 1. The multiplicative, multiplicative inverse is this something. Well, it's also 3. 3 times 3 is 9, mod 8 leaves us 1. So the multiplicative inverse of 3 turns out to be 3 in this case. So it becomes 5 times 3. Mod 8, 15 mod 8, is 7. 5 divided by 3 is 7 in mod 8. Confusing yet? Any questions? Same concepts that we've known since primary school, adding numbers, dividing numbers, but now we just formalize some aspects of it. We talk about an additive inverse, Add two numbers, you get zero. Multiplicative inverse, multiply two numbers, you get one. Division is the same as multiplying by the multiplicative inverse. But now we just do all of that mod n, mod 8 in our examples. 5 divided by 3 is 5 times the multiplicative inverse of 3. What is that? 3 times something, mod 8 equals 1. Well, 3 times 3, mod 8 equals 1. So, in fact, it's its own multiplicative inverse. 5 times 3, all mod 8, gives us 7. <coughs> Try that one. Six divided by four, mod eight. It's not zero. So go through the steps. What do we need to find? Four times something equals one. 
That is, we need to find the multiplicative inverse of 4. To do division, Six times, what is the multiplicative inverse of 4? Well, it's a number such that 4 times that number, mod 8, equals 1. What is this number? Nine? There is no such number in this case. You will not find one. You cannot multiply four by any integer and mod by eight to get one. Therefore, there is no multiplicative inverse of four. So, we cannot do it. There's no answer. So, in this case, we cannot divide, uh, we cannot do six divided by four in mod eight. There's no answer. Not every integer has a multiplicative inverse. We said that every integer has an additive inverse, but it doesn't apply for a multiplicative inverse. Let's check them. Again, we're still in mod 8 or Z8. In Z8, the set is 0 to 7, so the numbers that we can deal with as input are 0 to 7. Let's find the multiplicative inverse of those numbers. What's the multiplicative inverse of, A, of 0? There is no number that we multiply by 0 and get 1 when we mod by 8, so there is none. 1. 1 times something mod 8 equals 1. 1 times 1. 1 times 1 mod 8 equals 1. Inverse of 2? There is none. 3 we've done before itself. 4, there is none. 5? itself. Six. Six times something mod eight equals one. Because six is even. We will not get, and we mod by an even number, we will not get one as an answer here. Seven. First point. Not every number has a multiplicative inverse in mod n. That's the first point, and it becomes important later. Uh, but in this case, Z8, we see that the numbers are multiplicative inverses of themselves. Let's see if that applies for all modulus. Let's try something else. Maybe back to, what do we have? Z10. Back to mod 10. Find the multiplicative inverses. Zero doesn't have one. One will always be itself. Two. Find it for the remaining numbers. Two times something mod 10. equal 1. Again, we have two even numbers. We will not be able to get an odd number 1 as the output in that case. 3. 3 times something mod 10 equals 1. 3 times 7 is 21. Mod 10 is 1. 4, no, even number won't work in this case. 5.
5 times something mod 10 will never leave us a remainder of 1. 6, no, even. 7 will be 3. They're the inverses of each other. So it goes in both directions. 9. 9 times 9 is 81. So this is just in a different modulus, modulus 10. We see the multiplicative inverses. It's not always true that they are the inverse of each other. That's the point here. 3 is the inverse of 7. So in Z8, each number that had an inverse was the inverse of its, itself, but that's not always true. That was a special case. So not all numbers have a multiplicative inverse which means we cannot divide by just any number. If we try to divide by a number that doesn't have a multiplicative inverse, we'll get no answer. We just don't define the answer. Any questions so far? We can do addition, subtraction. Subtraction is just adding the additive inverse. We can do multiplication and division. Division is just multiplying by the multiplicative inverse, what's left? What other two operations do we commonly use? Raised to the power, so a to the power of b, for example, exponentiation, and the inverse of exponentiation is logarithm. So really exponentiation is just multiplication multiple times. 2 to the power of 3 is 2 times 2 times 2. So exponentiation is quite easy. We just, if we were trying to calculate, just do it in, uh, calculate in normal arithmetic and mod by n. For example, we're still in Z8. Five to the power of two. Just use normal arithmetic. Five to the power of two is twenty-five. Mod by eight, and you get one. So exponentiation is easy. Logarithm, really exponentiation is multiplication multiple times. Logarithm follows from that, the inverse of uh, exponentiation. In the same way that we, not every number has a multiplicative inverse, we cannot find the logarithm of any, of, of we cannot find the logarithm in modular arithmetic of every possible value. We will not go to logarithms yet, they're a little bit harder. We'll go through some other properties and return to them later. Let's go back to our slides and see what we've said. Modular arithmetic is just performing arithmetic operations within that set Zn, where we mod by n. We'll make use of it in public key cryptography and other techniques. Some of the properties of our normal arithmetic also apply. Uh, so the, the, the laws for normal arithmetic, which you use every day, but maybe you don't remember them, but uh, uh, also apply for modular arithmetic. And actually it makes life easier in terms of implementing, implementing different uh, algorithms. For example, A mod N plus b mod n, all mod n is the same as a plus b mod n, similar for subtraction and especially for multiplication. a times b mod n is the same as a mod n times b mod n, all mod n. Okay. Those rules apply and some of the others listed down there, um, additive inverse, distributive law, associative law, and so on. But this one is useful. It's useful in solving, uh, calculating the mod of large numbers. Okay. 
That is, A times B mod N, if A and B are large numbers, we multiply them together, we get a very large number. And then try and find mod N. A simpler way is to, if you know A and B, first find A mod N, then find B mod N, and you get smaller numbers. When you mod by N, you can get smaller numbers, and then multiply them together and mod by N. And in terms of implementation, that can make algorithms faster to finding the mod of a large number. Uh, an example. Let's apply that in an example. Let's find by hand, that is without a calculator, uh, a couple of examples. First, try to use that rule to find 160 mod 8. You could find it directly in this case because the numbers are small enough, but try and use that rule and think, well, some number, if we can break it into its divisors, we have 160, it's treat 160 as A times B, find some A and B, which gives us 160, and then simply mod those numbers by N first. Well, there are different divisors, but I'll try easy ones. 10 times 16. 160 is 10 times 16. And following our, our rule, that's the same as 10 mod 8 times 16 mod 8. all mod 8. Ten mod 8, easy. Sixteen mod 8, zero, all mod 8. Zero mod 8 returns a zero. The remainder when we divide 160 by 8 is 0. Well, with small numbers, you don't need to apply that rule, but when you have larger numbers, even with implementing software to do this for us, using such properties can make implementations much faster. One more. Uh, let's try eleven to the power of seven mod thirteen. No calculator. I've done this in quizzes. Solve it. 11 to the power of 7 mod 13. Remembering raising something to the power, exponentiation is simply just multiplying multiple times. What can we do? We want to, the idea is to break, instead of 11 to the power of 7, break that into smaller numbers multiplied together and then mod them by 13 so we get small numbers. Because if you calculate 11 to the power of 7, you get a large number. All right, not too large, but uh, larger than that we can easily do in our head or quickly do. Well, we can think in different ways, but one way is to say, well, that's...
our properties of exponentiation still apply here? It's just, so this is 11 multiplied by itself seven times. Well, we can split it into four times, times two times, times one. Four plus two plus one is seven. Let's move over here. Do parts of them at least. 11 to the power of 4, my brain cannot do that. Let's treat it as 11 squared squared. Maybe I should put brackets there. 11 to the power of 4 is 11 squared all squared. Eleven squared, we can do that. It's 121. Eleven mod 13. Simply eleven. Eleven squared, so it's actually one hundred and twenty one squared mod thirteen times keep the brackets here. One hundred and twenty one mod thirteen, we need to do that in our brain. What do you get? A remainder of four. Nine times thirteen is a hundred and seventeen. Remainder four. Slowly. And one hundred and twenty one mod thirteen is four. We just got that. One hundred and twenty one squared mod thirteen is the same as one hundred and twenty one mod thirteen times one hundred and twenty one mod thirteen which is the same as 4 times 4 mod 13. And I forgot my mod 13. 121 mod 13 times 121 mod 13, all mod 13, is 4 times 4, all mod 13, or 4 squared mod 13, 16 mod 13. We've still got 4 and 11. Sixteen mod thirteen. Well, you can actually solve it there. Uh, 12 times 11. Hundred and thirty-two, so 13 times 10, remainder will be 2. So we can take all right, this wasn't a very large number, but 11 to the power of 7, something we cannot easily, quickly do in our head. 
11 to the power of 7 mod 13, applying the rules of uh, expanding the multiplication, we can step through and find uh, the final answer. Now the point isn't that you need to do this all the time. Okay? The point is that when we have very large numbers, a very large number raised to the power of another large number, and then mod by some large number, calculating that directly is quite slow. But steps like this can be implemented in an algorithm that will reduce those large numbers down. That's what we're doing. Instead of 11 to the power of 7 mod 13, we bring it down to the smaller numbers, which can be calculated faster. So algorithms will apply these techniques to make the calculation feasible in, in a computer. And again, by very large numbers, I mean maybe hundreds of digits, not two or one digit. Let's introduce a new concept. So there are different properties that are used. And I don't normally require you to use them much, maybe once or twice in a quiz, that's all. But that one at least. But the others, uh, we don't solve modular arithmetic by hand much. It's just illustrating the concepts. Division, we'll return to, well, no, we've, ah. Maybe we've missed something here in division. Let's return to it. In division, we said we can divide when we have a multiplicative inverse. And we found that not every number has a multiplicative inverse. In Z8, we found 1, 3, 5, and 7 were inverses of themselves. In Z10, for example, we found 1, and 1, 3 and 7 are inverses, and 9 is its own inverse. The inverse is when we multiply those two numbers and mod by n, we get 1. You can show that for a number to have an inverse, it needs to be relatively prime with n. A number A has a multiplicative inverse in mod n if A is relatively prime with n. That is, the greatest common divisor of A in the modulus is 1. So that's one location where we use relatively prime. Let's just check if that was the case here. n is 8 in this case, so is 1 relatively prime with 8? Greatest common divisor of 1 and 8 is 1. So 1 and 8 are relatively prime. 2 and 8 are not relatively prime. The greatest common divisor of 2 and 8 is 2. They are not relatively prime, therefore 2 does not have a multiplicative inverse in mod 8. 3 and 8 are relatively prime. Greatest common divisor is 1, therefore 3 does have a multiplicative inverse. For Z10, for example, 2 and 10, the greatest common divisor is 2. Therefore, 2 and 10 are not relatively prime. Therefore, 2 does not have a multiplicative inverse. For a number to have a multiplicative inverse, that number must be relatively prime with the modulus n. 3 and 10 are relatively prime. 7 and 10 are relatively prime. 9 and 10 are relatively prime. So they have multiplicative inverses. So if we want to have a number that has a multiplicative inverse, then we choose a number that is relatively prime with a modulus n. And that will become useful later when we use this uh, in our security mechanisms. Let's finish with one more concept. Um, and as, as an example,
what numbers less than 4 are relatively prime with 4? Let's do the long way. Relatively prime means the greatest common divisor of that number and of those two numbers is 1. Greatest common divisor of 1 and 4? 1. Greatest common divisor of 2 and 4? 2. And 3 and 4? 1. Is also 1. So which numbers less than 4 are relatively prime with 4? 1 is relatively prime with 4. 2 is not relatively prime with 4. 3 is. So in this case, two numbers which are less than 4 are RP, relatively prime with 4. Okay. So given some number, in this example, 4, let's find the numbers less than that number and count how many are relatively prime with it. In this case, 2 is the answer because there are two numbers. This is called the totient or Euler's totient. We write it as this. Euler's totient function counts the number of numbers less than 4 which are relatively prime with 4? The answer is 2 in this case. There are two numbers less than 4 which are relatively prime with 4. That's the definition of Euler's totient function. Try it with some others. What's the totient of 9? Find the totient of 9. That is, for numbers 1 up until 8, check whether they're relatively prime with 9. If they are, count how many are. Let's do it the long way. So the numbers 1 up until 9, so 1, I'll list them. Is 1 relatively prime with 9? Greatest common divisor of 1 and 9? Yes. Is 2 relatively prime with 9? Yes. 3 and 9? No, they have a divisor of 3. 4 and 9? 5 and 9? 6 and 9? They have a divisor of 3. 7 and 9? 8 and 9? What's the answer? 6. There are 6 numbers less than 9 which are relatively prime with 9. Totient of 7. <laughs> 1 and 7. Yes. 2 and 7. Yes. 3 and 7. Yes. 4 and 7. Yes. 5 and 7. Yes. 6 and 7. All of the numbers less than 7 are relatively prime with 7. Why? <coughs> 7 is prime. That is, the only divisors of 7 are 1 in itself. 
So the greatest common divisor of some number and 7, when that number is less than 7, will always be 1. So when we have a prime number, it's quite easy to calculate here. It's actually the number minus 1, because it's the number's less than 7, 1 through to 6 in this case. The totient of 13 is 12. 13 is prime, therefore the numbers 1 up until 12, 12 numbers, are relatively prime with 13. The totient of a prime p is quite simply p minus 1. So if the number is prime, then it's easy. If it's not prime, if it's composite, then we need some way to calculate the totient. And again, it turns out when a, we have a very large number, a very large composite number, not prime, calculating the totient of that is very hard. It takes a lot of time. So very large number, the totient is very hard to calculate. We're not finished yet. Last one on the totient. Totient of 5. Totient of 35. Is 35 prime? What do we know about 35? It's 7 times 5. Okay, why did I do that? Because I know that actually the, the totient of two prime numbers multiplied together is the same as the totient of those primes multiplied together. That is, And we know the totient of 7 is 6, and the totient of 5 is 4, so the answer is 24. Calculating the totient of a large number is very hard. It takes a long time. Except under certain conditions. If we have a large number, and if we can break it into its prime factors, we broke 35 into 7 and 5, the prime factors of 35. Then a property of the totient is that the totient of two primes multiplied together is the same as the totient of each prime and then multiply. And the totient of a prime is just that prime minus 1. This is easy to calculate. We didn't have to go through 1 to 34. And that concept is used again in cryptography one way, if you know the factors, calculating the totient is easy. If we know 7 and 5, it's easy to find 24. But if we don't know the prime factors of this number, then calculating the totient is hard. And in fact, that's a key part of RSA, public key cryptography. We will stop there. We'll see some other properties on uh, arithmetic, modular arithmetic next week. Have a look at your assignment. Okay, Some encryption that you need to do with some software over the next week. And ask me any questions on Tuesday. <laughs>